Hi everyone, this is Karim, Karim with Solar Academy. Today I have with me John Bonanno again, and we have a very interesting um, guest, Mike Burtz. Um, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the battery technologies that are evolving out there. Um, most of us know about the bigger companies and uh, John and I, as, as the audience knows, uh, we help uh, clean tech startups and uh, in terms of finance and uh, advisorship in, at the early stages. John, you brought up, um, you, you introduced me to Mike uh, recently and we had an amazing conversation last week. Can you share with us a little bit why you think uh, Mike's company, Enzinc, is um, a game changer in, that is uh, up and coming? And, okay. and then maybe we yeah, can- Yeah, thanks, Karim. I, I mean, I love being on Solar Academy. It's, uh, it's no higher uh, calling than to, to than to teach and to be in partnership um, as I have been with Mike uh, for the better part of a year and a half or so. I serve the company and also Mike as a senior advisor. But let's step back for a second and look at the megatrends that are happening in energy storage. And you see at the municipal level, federal and state, um, bipartisan infrastructure, multi-trillion dollars being deployed for advanced energy storage. Um, and we want to see these things, as everyone knows, we want to see these things scale to meaningful velocity and to have impact in the field as quickly as possible. And so we look out to the things that are already there. And the two big behemoths in the market is lead acid, historical, poor performance, low cost, high OPEX, toxic, no fire, wide operating, wide operating range. So that's a good thing. Then you have lithium ion, great performance, high cost coming down, fire potential, not great, and narrow, wide, narrow uh, operating uh, uh, temperature range, which is a problem. And so we look at all of these triangulations and we say, how can we leverage this infrastructure spending with our partners in government? How can we go quickly into the market and to meaningful scale and velocity, how do we go and claim as many of those benefits as we possibly can around performance? And so I have worked with Mike and the first thing you'll find out about Mike is he's got impeccable uh, values as a person. In addition to the fact that he's a great engineer and he has been incredible at recruiting top talent. So, you know, I'm a vested party and, you know, we were discussing that last week. Uh, but I, you know, Mike, I think you should really uh, take over here and just sort of give an introduction on, on NZINC because it's, it really is such a, a, an interesting thing that you're doing. Oh, oh, thank you, John. And thank you, Karen. It's a real pleasure to be on the Solar Academy. So uh, just for orientation, I'm speaking to you from our engineering lab at the Richmond Field Station uh, operated by University of California, Berkeley. So right next door is where we're doing all our development. Um, NZINC was founded to basically exploit some technology that was originally developed by the United States Naval Research Laboratory. And they were interested in an alternative to lithium ion specifically for safety reasons, right? You know, aboard ships, subs, aircraft, and so on. And they started looking at zinc. And so we got involved with them a number of years ago uh, because some of the requirements that the Navy had around the performance and safety for military applications are directly applicable to con you know, the commercial industrial applications and specifically energy storage for solar and uh, frequency regulation and backup power and uh, um, uh, you know, mitigation. So uh, the, the secret sauce is um, a zinc anode but it's made in the form of a sponge. Now, a lot of people know that zinc is a really interesting material for batteries. The first person to play with it was Thomas Edison in 1901. But unfortunately, Mr. Edison did not have access to a scanning electron microscope. Uh, and he couldn't see these things called dendrites forming, which are needle-like formations that grow very quickly, particularly in zinc and can short out the battery. And this limited zinc for decades to a disposable battery. But he had the right material, he just had the wrong form. I mean, zinc is like the fourth most mined metal on the planet. Uh, it's uh, 
It's cheap. It's about a dollar a pound. Uh, it uses a water-based electrolyte so that there's no fire. Um, it's completely recyclable, which is really important for our ethos in terms of trying to advance a green agenda, you know, a green technology, uh, renewable technologies. And it can give you the high energy and the high power that you need, once again, if it's in the right form. So what we started working with are these little guys, which are zinc sponges, just like the sponge on your kitchen sink, uh, except at the micro level. And what that does is it makes more of the zinc available for the reaction. Uh, but because of the zinc sponge structure, it completely eliminates dendrite growth. So there's the attributes that people were searching for for decades on how to make zinc worthwhile. And we've cracked those problems, which is high energy density, high specific energy, recyclable, very easy you know, to manufacture. Uh, we're in the midst right now of scaling it up from these guys to bigger size guys so that we can test it with our prototype batteries. But the other interesting part, and this is to John's point and Karim, your, your point, is to meet those needs of this rapidly expanding desire for energy storage, particularly for residential, commercial, industrial, and solar. You've got to be able to deploy these technologies quickly. Many technologies that people are working with require you to start from ground zero. They require you to literally develop the factory, build a complete supply chain, build the factory, build your sales and distribution, uh, set up your warranty and liability and so on. And we thought that's not really the best way to do this as quickly as possible to meet these you know, rapidly required objectives, particularly you know, with scientists telling us you know, by 2030, uh, we really better have all our stuff together. So the business model that we've decided on is we, we want speed to scale. And what that means is instead of us being a battery manufacturer, we'll be an advanced battery developer to where we can exploit this new zinc electrode. We'll test that battery and then what we're going to do is take it to existing battery manufacturers, particularly the legacy battery manufacturers, such as lead acid or nickel metal hydride nickel CAD, because we have analyzed it. Members of our team have really extensive experience in battery manufacturing. We can use those existing facilities by simply having that anode be a drop-in replacement for the cathodes. So what we've done is we've decided that the best way to do it is to take advantage of existing battery factories. So let's take, for example, lead acid, right? Many plants across the United States and North America, their batteries have a specific energy of around 30 to 40 watt hours per kilogram. What if you could go into those manufacturers and say, I've got a way in which you can use your existing facility, your existing capex, your existing people, take advantage of those and produce a battery which has the energy of lithium ion, but is more like your operational costs and is easier to recycle. I can use your same recycling facilities and it's safer for people to use and has a wider temperature range like your lead acid battery. Therefore, it can be used from you know, the heat of Arizona all the way up to the cold of Minnesota. That way we can then quickly take those battery factories, triple their you know, gigawatt output without any kind of massive investment in CapEx. And so then quickly we can have gigafactories scale at a very rapid pace. And Karim, that's what we're working on. Yeah. So that is kind of like an Intel inside strategy. For, <laughs> very for good. The, for the industry. Right, so we'll just use NSYNC inside then. Yeah, and you, you've been working on this for how long, Mike? So the Navy uh, has been working on this for a number of years. Uh, they started probably about 10 years ago working on the technology when we first got involved with evaluating it. We then uh, were able to help the Navy get the patent. Uh, then we got the exclusive license to develop it for both electric vehicles as well as stationary uh, applications. So we moved into the lab here uh, in late 2019. And so for the last two years, then we've been rapidly moving from 
technology transfer from the Navy to building our own cells. And then by the first part of next year, we'll be building our own battery. And, and Karen, it's, it's also important to note here that um, this is a breakthrough technology. It's such an enabler, but you know, Mike and the team have won ARPA-E awards. They've won CalSeed Concept and CalSeed Prototype. They've won the Cal Testbed Award. They won the People's Choice Award at the Clean Tech Open. I mean, this is a well-awarded core technology. And so you start thinking about that this is U.S. energy storage manufacturing renaissance driven by a U.S. innovation, intellectual property, supply chain, and job creation, producing world-class products that are competitive with all alternatives. So when you look at all of them, lithium hocus pocus or whatever the heck the next, um, you know, cockamamie story out of the lithium nirvana is going to be, everyone's got to like ground themselves in reality. And I, you know, I strongly feel, and, and, and I serve as an advisor to another energy startup, uh, energy storage startup, they're attacking different spaces. So there's no conflict, but we have to look beyond lithium is, is really a key consideration. And when you start looking at energy storage, especially capital allocators, they have to put on the lenses or the glasses of the buying partner. How do you buy energy storage? You buy energy energy storage for the specific application you are trying to solve. If it's a stationary uh, energy storage medium, then you think, what's my capacity requirement? Is someone going to shoot a bullet at this thing ever? Does it have a, you know, could it, you know, bang into something in a warehouse really hard or, you know, and, and those things all can create fire in lithium. So um, you have to really think in systems. Mike, talk a little bit about how you went through during your first eight and change years, developed, co-developing this technology, working with the US Navy on the patents, working on the, the licensing. Talk about how you see the systems and the in-situ application set. Sure, John. Um, let me put it in context with my background because you know you, you yeah, kind of you do talked about that. Going. So yeah, so my, my background is actually aerospace engineering. Um, worked at General Dynamics for a number of years, worked on the Tomahawk cruise missile, was the, the designer and builder of the first missiles, so the stealth cruise missile. So uh, I, can point, I can point to something where I took it from a clean sheet of paper to actually delivering to Edwards Air Force Base. Um, worked at Nissan in both their advanced design and was program manager for their Carter race at Le Mans. Um, worked uh, for Computer Sciences Corporation. Um, and how do we then design vehicles? How do we design products you know, in a virtual environment? Uh, the point that I wanted to make is uh, what I was involved in was the design of systems, not components. And a lot of people then treat you know, the cell or they evaluate the cell uh, and think of it in, in just that point of view. And what you have to do is you have to look at it as a system. And as John referred to, you have to look at what's the application as well as then how is it gonna be used from you know, womb to tomb, from the beginning to the end, the whole circular economy picture. And that's where we think um, that we stepped back and spent several years working with the Navy on particular, not just the technology, but what is the system attributes that make the most sense for use in the commercial and the, you know, the uh, industrial world. So when, when you take a look at it, uh, I gave a talk oh, probably three years ago at the Institute of Scrap Recyclers where I was briefing people on batteries because you know batteries suddenly became of interest. And the interesting thing about the Institute of Scrap Recyclers are they get to see everything that society makes and disposes. And they get to see what it is that survives and doesn't, and then what do we do with it? And they were all really worried about what are we going to do with batteries? And we hear about these electric cars and what are we going to do with these batteries? And they have warehouses full of batteries that they do not know what to do. With. There, is, there is at the moment not a really good plan or an economic method. People are working on it, but what do you do with it? So in other words, from the, from the building of it and the type of materials that you're using all the way through to the manufacture of it should be low carbon as well. We're about one half the greenhouse gas emissions as lead acid and about one twentieth that of lithium ion to the way in which it gets used uh, you know, in the system, and then how do you dispose of it? 
And it's at that systems level that you get another one of these um, areas of evaluation, right? Because you can't just look at the specific energy or the energy density. You have to look at several axes that are important to people who are going to use it. And that involves uh, how safe is it, right? I mean, I dealt a lot with, uh, when I worked at our forward division, man-rated systems, people's safety came paramount, right? So where is it going to be used and are people going to be involved and how, how important is that? How much energy do I necessarily need? And what is my effective energy, right? In other words, if you just have a cell, it delivers X amount you know, on your specific energy or your energy density. But that cell isn't what's going to power you know, a car or even you know, a backup power system particularly if it's a system that uses a very high energy or very energy dense material like lithium, you're going to need auxiliary systems to make sure that it's safe, which means you're going to need things like active cooling systems. You're going to need a very sophisticated battery management system. You're going to need armor and shielding to protect it from, as John says, you know, damage that could occur, whether it's natural or evil. All of those items then affect in the watt hours per kilogram, they start increasing the kilogram part, which brings down that effective specific energy. And in the dollars per kilowatt hour, the dollars start to go up because you've got all these additional systems. So when you look at the technology, you have to look at all those systems, all that, you know, that's, that's going to affect your decision making. And you have to look at the effective specific energy and the effective cost. I mean, we might, uh, I, I know this is kind of a mean thing to say, but if you take a look at what happened with the Chevy Bolt, Chevy now has to recall all their vehicles, 140,000 vehicles. The effective specific or the, the, the energy, the, the cost dollar per kilowatt hour, you know, for those, uh, for those cells was around $145 per kilowatt hour. But if you have to replace every single, and you have to do it again, the effective cost is now $290 per kilowatt hour. So, you know, those kind of attributes, those kind of decisions have to be made on a systems level, all the way from the building of it, all the way through to the disposal of it. And that's where we think that zinc batteries in general, and our battery in particular, have a, a distinct differentiator and a distinct uh, uh, advantage over over other other battery systems. Thank you, Mike, for this uh, in-depth review of NZINC and its technology and its history. I have one curious question, by the way, and the question is this: um, I've read at multiple resources that it takes about you know, if you look at a single solar panel, the amount of energy it takes to produce that panel versus the clean energy that panel produces over its lifetime is like a one to 30 ratio. So it takes about one year of energy that the panel would produce to produce the, to manufacture the actual panel. Mm -hmm. And then for about 25 to 29 years, you're getting clean energy out of it. So the, the curious question that I have is how does that math change when you run the world on a solar plus battery reality? Because the amount of- wow. Uh, the amount of energy it takes to produce the battery should also be taken into account in the future clean energy future that right. we're all envisioning. So, so I can give you an indirect answer mm -hmm. because I uh, because I think that's a really good question. Um, I think I mentioned you know that that we put out about one half in, in the manufacturing. We've done an analysis of the manufacturing flow. We put out about half the greenhouse gases. Uh, and I can't remember what the energy level is, but it's much less, you know, than, than lead acid. And it's about one twentieth that of lithium ion. Oh my God. Wow. That's GHG. That's GHG. For the production of a similar capacity battery. That's correct. That's wow. correct. So that is. So, and so to answer your question. Yeah. So in terms of the systems approach, if yeah. you take a look at the lifetime, you know, that yes, the lithium ion battery uh, you know, we'll, ha we'll have to do a lot to make up for all the energy and greenhouse gases that went into producing it. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I also think it's, it's noteworthy that, you know, the U S does not have an exorbitant supply of lithium and the U S does not have existing infrastructure doing lithium manufacturing today. And so when you start to say lithium is everything, you're basically outsourcing your entire supply chain to potential foes. And you're saying, we're going to either invest extraordinary amounts of CapEx in building lithium manufacturing in the United States, or we're going to outsource that also. And I think both of those outcomes for any nation, not just the United States, but any nation that does not do good things for your political decision-making if others have leverage on you. And I would argue that energy storage is a national security issue because these are gonna be components, key components in an energy system that can be controlled. And so, you know, just like any concern around generators or these types of things, there's, there should be concern around this too. Good points. And it seems like when Enzing has grown a little bit more, it can be the Intel inside, inside a lithium ion <laughs> facility as well. <laughs> Theoretically, but it's more likely that uh, lead acid, nickel metal hydride, and nickel CAD current manufacturers would be interested in adopting sure. this technology because it's, as Mike said before, it's very financially benign relatively. Uh, to transition to making superior batteries and com that are com totally competitive with lithium today um, by just slotting in the z proprietary zinc anode with another cathode, uh, you know, that's... Mike, why don't you speak to that? That's actually kind of interesting. Talk to the, talk to the, the platform uh, that NZINC is building. This isn't just a one-off battery right. design. It's a whole platform. Right. So before I leap into that, John, one of the things that we, we should take a look at, uh, Karim, there's a plant in Pennsylvania called East Penn, which builds uh, batteries for everybody, you know, like Duracell or uh, Interstate, right? In other words, they don't build an East Penn battery. They, they literally build a, brand, a label for everyone else. That plant, in terms of size, puts anything that Elon Musk has to shame. It's huge, it's acres and acres of, of lead acid manufacturing. So imagine if we took that and converted it to building these batteries and, and the battery manufacturing that's in Georgia, which you know was Trojan battery, and the guys in uh, Concord and the guys in uh, Superior batteries. If all of those things, we could, we could leapfrog and as John says, without having to import, you know, uh, both either chemicals or batteries, you know, then you could leapfrog into gigafactory scale uh, with these kind of batteries built with, you know, American factories and American technology. What John is referring to is zinc is a very interesting electrode. And what it means is you can couple it with different cathode materials for different applications. So once we crack the problem of making this little guy that was high performance, rechargeable, right? Then we can start to say, well, let's couple it first with nickel, which we're doing because it's well characterized. You know, people know it, we can get to market quickly, but we can couple it with manganese for a manganese zinc battery which has about twice the energy of lead acid, but it's like a quarter the cost of a lead acid battery. So there are applications, right, where you don't need the high energy, but you just need a stable battery. So you can couple it with manganese, you can couple it with silver, which the military and NASA want, right? Commercially, no one's gonna buy a silver cathode, but the military will. And now you have a very safe, very high performance battery. And then there's the ultimate, which is couple it with carbon for a zinc air battery. And there, what we can truly get is an installed specific energy of over 250 to 350 watt hours per kilogram at a very low cost because all you're using is zinc and carbon. Why that's interesting is that people have been trying to make lithium air batteries for a decade. 
if you remember from chemistry, lithium and water don't really like to get, you know, they don't get along. So you have to provide nearly perfect, pure, dry air. So the infrastructure, this is where that effective specific energy thing comes in. Even though the theoretical specific energy of a lithium air battery is probably five to 600 watt hours per kilogram, by the time you put all the equipment necessary to give it perfectly dry air, you're right back down to a regular lithium ion battery. So for some applications, if you can afford to do it, that's really great. We, on the other hand, work on the Pareto principle where we can get 80% of the performance, right, for only 20% of the cost. And so that's kind of the ultimate goal is to deliver on that platform. So it's not just one battery. It's not just a nickel zinc battery. It's a platform of batteries. Great. Thanks for that explanation, Mike. I have one, one more question for you. And that is, given where you are right now and your priorities, if you could wish for the top five things to happen in the next year, like what, what would those five, three to five things would be? Other, other than sufficient capital to, to move this forward? Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Including capital, I guess. Yeah, so cap, capital would be really great because right now, uh, you know, we've been working serially. Right. And there's a bunch of things that we could do in parallel, which would help rapidly implement, you know, uh, so we could expand here at the Richmond Field Station, you know, with that capital, then we could uh, we could move forward with, you know, the equipment and particularly the personnel to be able to do the necessary testing that that we've got. We have been speaking to uh, legacy ba battery manufacturers who are intrigued with what we're talking about, but you know, batteries are mission critical. They're very much a show me type of organization. So the second thing is we'd like to get some more battery manufacturers on board with us. So we'd like to you know, get our testing done. And testing, by the way, takes a long time, right? You know, if you're gonna do 500 cycles, you've gotta do 500 cycles, you can't speed it up. Yeah. Uh, but what we need to do is then get those get those people um, involved, right? So that so that they can they can see what the benefits are, and we could run a pilot with them. We'd also like to see from the policy point of view, uh, and I know that the administration has talked about it, but really given a preference to kind of buy American. You know, I mean, this is an American developed technology that can use American resources and American jobs. Uh, we think that support from both uh, local, state, and particularly federal, particularly federal on that. Uh, we've received a lot of support from the state of California, as John mentioned, with CalSeed and with uh, the Cal test bed. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like to see, you know, more of that um, so that we can, we can, bring this bring this to market you know a lot quicker so those are really kind of the, i know you asked for five but that really uh, those are the top three, three. To five, so and, and and karen when you look at the more. map of where energy storage batteries are being manufactured today you see clustering because it's uh typically an exercise that you want to put in in you know uh, highly centralized areas so you can get those efficiencies you see places like Georgia, Ohio, Missouri, um, coming Kentucky. up, Kentucky, with, with a lot of clustering. Um, and so do we want to uh, bring a renaissance to American innovation in energy storage to create a superior global energy storage medium? I think that's possible. And I think it's possible with business strategies and core technology like NZINC. Right. Nothing better than distributed power and energy for the world. And jobs and manufacturing. Yeah, and, right. and local economies. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, just, just as a, a real quick one, you know, down in LA, and I can't remember the name of the factory now, but it was a lead acid factory. Um, it's all wrapped in plastic now because of its, you know, the toxic waste. Wow. And, you know, disadvantaged, you know, low income disadvantaged communities are around that. And if you could put in a manufacturing facility that didn't have any of those kind of toxic materials, 
that would help the community because the jobs would be there, the batteries to help with their distributed grid would be there, and it would be, you know, it would be, it would be safe. So, yeah. Right. Local sustainable circular economy. That's right. There we go. Well, Mike, thank you very much for sharing your story and project and the details of the technology. And John, thank you very much for bringing this, bring this, bringing this uh, amazing uh, startup to Solar Academy. And uh, we'll do more of these sessions as you continue your journey, I'm sure. Excellent, Karen. Thank Thanks, you very Mike. much for the opportunity. We look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you.